So now, um, so what are the interventions that our government is undertaking to restore energy security? There's four that I would like to highlight. The four that are instruments that are being used is the first is there's a planning instrument called the Integrated Resources Plan. That planning instrument has scientists and energy experts and government officials sitting together in the department deciding on what is the investment plan for the various sources of energy that we should be investing in to achieve energy security. It's informed by two major imperatives. The one is what is the lowest cost to get there? Obviously, as economists, we're always concerned about low costs. What is the lowest cost to achieve energy security? And what policy adjustments do we need to make to that lowest cost? And as economists, that's when you get nervous because the politicians tell you about the policy adjustment on top of the lowest cost. So the lowest cost instrument is saying that it's called the Integrated Resources Plan. And through that plan, the government intends investing in 30,000 megawatts of new electricity. So I said we've got an expensive problem of an energy shortage. It's broken our growth model. It's broken. You know, we, the economists from Harvard speak about a binding constraint. The binding constraint on South African growth, you could argue very strongly, is the shortage of electricity. We're not going to create jobs. We're not going to have growth until we get over the shortage of electricity. So there's a 30,000 plan that's planned through the Integrated Resources Plan from the Department of Minerals and Resources, who, in, who are implementing that plan. And that includes, it's a 10-year plan to build 30,000 megawatts. How much is 30,000 megawatts? 30,000 megawatts is probably South Africa's current demand. If you watch the ESCOM figures every day, is around 29,000, 30,000 megawatts. That's what our current demand is. So when we have load shedding, it means that we're demanding 30,000, but we're only producing 24,000 or 26,000. And then you have load shedding where they must switch off the demand. You switch off the demand in different suburbs, different townships, different villages. You switch off the demand. You shed the, you shed the demand so that your 26,000 is enough to deliver electricity to the country. It's all managed from, I don't know if you know, the area in Germiston Lake. There's a central point there where ESCOM decides on how much electricity it has. In the, South Africa has a national grid. Um, we've got a national grid which is managed as a key central point. We don't have many, like, we have some mini grids in far-flung areas off the national grid, but they're very marginal. Whether you are in Cape Town, or whether you are in, in Pumalanga, or whether you are in Mpopo, you've all got one grid which is managed by one central grid company called ESCOM. And it must decide supply and demand. Economists like supply and demand. So if the supply is more than the demand, you don't have load shedding. If the demand is more than the supply, you have to have load shedding very quickly. Because if you don't do the load shedding quickly, the system will start to, 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 to risk tripping. And then it can take many days to get the system running again. So it has to be managed quickly in real time. So that's the first instrument, the government's planning. And we have what they call the bid windows. So the, the IRP has got the bid windows. They say, we are going to have bid window number five, bid window number six. At this point, we are procuring 10,000. And then the companies bid. And they say, we will supply this electricity to South Africa. Maybe it's 1,000 or 500 megawatts. And this is the price. And then the, 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 go the government department called the IPP, Independent Power Producer Office, IPP office. That office then looks at which is the, the most attractive bid. And it, it awards the tender. And the, the beauty of this for the companies that are bidding is that they are going to get paid, guaranteed payment from ESCOM for the next 10 years. It's a guaranteed payment. So you bid, you say, I'll sell it to ESCOM for 10 years through my solar plant or through my wind plant or through my um, uh, battery plant, whatever, whatever it is that you're bidding, and you get a guarantee. So this is, this is the main instrument. If we talk about the central planning of the solution, it is being centrally planned through the IRP, the Integrated Resources Plan. It's the number one instrument. But it's hitting up with some serious constraints. What are the serious constraints? The one is our fiscal position. Our fiscal position. Because all of this is guaranteed, because it's guaranteed, it costs the fiscus 
on, if you look at the, the guarantees on our fiscus, it costs on the fiscus. So because of that, it costs on the fiscus. Okay, the second instrument is, um, is a newer instrument. And this is where the private sector is being allowed not to come and bid in the same way, but is being allowed to build a plant at its, at its hotels, at its factories, at its mines, on its farms, without having to get a license. Before, there was a very strong license regime. Trying to, we have a monopoly. There's a monopoly that says only ESCOM can make power. That's the law. Only ESCOM can make power. The, the law changes says, no, you can make power without a license. Up to 100 megawatts. This was a reform that came into place in South Africa during the course of last year. And it's because of the, the fiscal constraint on the government through the IRP, this is seen as a very um, nimble and quick response to try and protect the jobs, protect the factories, protect what exists already by ensuring that those firms that are being compromised because they don't have electricity can have electricity if they're prepared to pay for it. The third is an emergency procurement program. This was done during the, the, the stage six load shedding that affected South Africa in December 2020. In 2019, there was an emergency procurement that took place. And uh, the emergency procurement is the one that includes a number of programs, including ships being pulled up to our harbors and being plugged into our national grid. Um, yeah, I'm trying to, but it's not moving. The, if you can help me again. The fourth item is, um, is the restructuring of ESCOM. Um, all right, so thank you. Okay, there's also some more recent proposals. There's quite a few proposals of, um, being presented uh, as to how, what else can be done to end load shedding as quickly as possible. I mean, there's a political cycle at play here as well. I mean, elections and all of these things are being affected by the lack of electricity. Um, there's an argument that the local government elections that took place in 2021 were seriously impacted by the shortage of electricity. So if you've got a plan that says by 2030 we will solve the electricity crisis and you've got an election in 2024, it can cause one to say, well, maybe we should come up with additional interventions to try and improve the situation. So there's quite a number Within that framework of the four major interventions, there's more rapid, kind of, what more rapidly can be done to secure the electricity supply in the country, which is costing us so much economically and politically. Um, the one is that this bid window should be accelerated. So the bid window, the RP instrument itself should be accelerated. The second is that the RMIPP design should be improved. Um, the third is that this is a controversial one and I'm speaking to the, one of the DGs on the way into this meeting now, that the local content requirements be limited, at least for a time. So if you think about this, if there's a local content requirement on, for example, solar panels, or there's a local content requirement um, on the, uh, the, wind, the, the wind turbine machinery, it's a sequencing problem, because if it's going to delay your addressing the electricity shortage, then you'll say, well, rather let's bring in imported items, get the electricity flowing, and then once that's happening, and once the investments are happening, because there's going to be investment over 10 years, we can say, okay, now we're suspending that, and we want to have local content requirements again. Because the argument right now is that if there's a local content requirement on some of this technology, it's going to further delay the investment, because we don't make some of those things in South Africa. We don't make them. Sadly, we used to make some of them. What happened was this was a highly political problem. The IRP, at some point, the leadership of ESCOM, the previous leadership of ESCOM, said we're not going to buy any more, uh, we're not going to buy any more uh, wind and solar. We can do it ourselves. So the factories that had been set up to build the solar panels in KZN and the wind turbines in the Eastern Cape, they were shut down. So now they're saying local content. So you need to have a consistency in your planning instrument. You can't say we're going to do this and then you stop doing this. And then we'll do this and stop start. And the stop start in the planning instrument meant that the local content piece collapsed. And now it is becoming an impediment. Uh, it's going to delay um, the, the, um, it's going to delay the uh, investment that is required in, to stop load shedding. There's other things as well. Um, did Mandy Rambao speak today? I saw she was on the program. Okay. So I thought she would have spoken 
Um, this is uh, the person who's leading the ESCOM Just Energy Transition Office. Her name is Mandy Rambaros. I thought she might have been here today. She was on one of the programs that I saw initially. She would have told you a lot more than I could tell you of how ESCOM, in particular around Mpumalanga. I'm going to show you something about Mpumalanga. I'll come to it now. This was the regional aspect. I'm afraid when I spoke about the region, I was speaking about the South African regions, not the African region, I'm afraid. But we can, we can talk about that maybe later. But you can see all the red marks in Mpumalanga. Can you see that far? What are those red marks? Can you see that far? Power stations. So all the power stations in South Africa are there in Mpumalanga. My friends here from Mpumalanga have heard me say this so many times. They said, tell us another story. So all the power stations are there. There's, there's a few ones up there in Mpopo. Here you've got a nuclear power station, which is it's not red. It's a yellow nuclear site. This is in Cape Town. Um, and then I'm going to come back to this. But just remember the story that the power grid, the power grid, because where is the, the, the coal, the coal fields of South Africa are in Mpumalanga. Okay, the coal fields from South Africa are in Mpumalanga. So therefore you build the power stations um, where the coal fields are. The apartheid government from the 1950s that built the power stations, so then you didn't even need trucks. You just put the coal onto the conveyor belt and it goes straight into the, into the power station. So this is what economists call path dependency. Where you find yourself today is dependent on how you got there. That's a path dependency. So we are, the, the, the grid in this country is in Mpumalanga. Um, there we go. I'll come back to that. Oopsie. Is there something wrong? Could be a user error. So, um, so the, the, the ESCOM Just Transition Office is putting a lot of effort for example, they're saying we're going to give the land, we're going to make land available around Pumalanga so that new um, wind and solar plants can be built on this land and can be put into the existing grid. And the purists say, no, don't do that. The best sun in the, in the world, the best sun in South Africa is not in Pumalanga. Where's the best sun in South Africa? Northern Cape. So, Northern Cape. You must build it in the Northern Cape. And they say, no, no, no. We're prepared to go for the second best sun. Because the second best option is already the grid there. You understand? So it's going to take many years to build the grid to the Northern Cape. Because there was nothing in the Northern Cape, just some cattle. Now you're saying there's the sun there. There's no grid. <laughs> okay. No offense. So I'm very biased towards Mpumalanga. They've, they've treated me well. So, all right. Okay. So you. So okay. So that. So what I'm. The, the, so Eskom is putting a lot of effort into that area. They're saying we're going to give the land. We're going to allow you near the grid to build. The beauty of this intervention, they say they've just awarded. They just announced that 18 100 megawatt power plants are to be built in Mpumalanga. No fiscal expenditure needed. No government guarantees needed. It's like there's old agents say if you build the hotel, they will come. You build the hotel, they will come. Look at this hotel. They built it, you can't. Okay? So you build, you build the power plant and people will buy the power. There's no risk for the government. It's all the risk is on the private sector. All the risk is on the private sector. Now this is not how we would have done it. But they say necessity is a mother of invention. We wouldn't have done it like this. We had, in, we had central planning, Chinese style, IRP, ESCOM, monopoly. We would have done it like that. But because you're in a crisis mode like this, and you need electricity really quickly, and you don't have fiscal space, you're finding that ESCOM is doing its just transition work, as I'm explaining to you, and they're allowing companies to invest, and those companies are, are being told, you must sell it in the open market. Sell it in the open market. People will buy your power. So it's a major change that's underway. I know you think this is a, uh, you've heard this before, but you can hear it again and again. It's a major, there's a transition. There's an energy transition. I can say it 10 times, there's an energy transition. There's a trans transition, things are changing. And they're changing, it's a, there's a deregulation, so there's a technological change. There's a, and there's a, 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 a regulatory change. And therefore there needs to be a structural change. So ESCOM will be restructured. ESCOM is this mega vertically integrated utility. It now needs to be broken into pieces in order to meet this new situation. What are the three pieces of ESCOM? 
The first piece is the generation piece. That's the one that makes the electricity. The second one is the transmission piece. Those are those big tower, those big cables that you see running across the country. That will be a different co company. And the third one is the most difficult one. That's the, that's the distribution in the township, in this informal settlement, in the suburb. It's difficult, but it will be it's, that's the third piece. That is the third piece. The one that is the most strategically important is the transmission piece. Because that transmission piece is going to be what connects the private and the public into a market where this electricity is going to be sold. It's going to be a, it's going to be a market, a liberalized market for electricity sale. And there's nothing stopping Southern Africa and others over time joining in to that liberalized market over time. Because in Namibia has got even better sun than in the Northern Cape, they say. Botswana, this, this, this is a region where there is some really, really uh, powerful solar and solar assets in particular. So let's go on, let's go on. Um, so it's a pity that ESCOM was not here to explain what I've just told you. Um, so this is some of the technological uh, and pricing that I, I would like you to see. I don't know if you can see that far. But let's, when you talk about building new, if you've got a shortage of electricity, you need to build new generation capacity. ASAP. There's, these are the options. PV, that stands for solar. Then wind, you know what that is. Gas, gas. Gas is generally uh, coming in from undersea drilling. We haven't, we've got a bit of interest in gas in this country, but uh, a lot of it's imported still. Nuclear is another technology, and coal is another technology. We, we don't have much in this South Africa for a hydropower. We do import some hydropower from Mozambique. And there is potential in the DRC for hydropower, but it's politically far away from us here. Yeah. So in terms of what the IRP looks at, it says these are the platforms that we want to we want to use. These figures come from ESCO 2021. What I want you to see clearly from these figures is if you're looking at the quickest deployment and the lowest cost to overcome the political and economic problem of load shedding, what will you do? If your job, if all the other members of the government were not available and they said, please, will you just tell us what to do? You would say, well, let me see. What is the quickest to deploy? And what is the lowest cost? So if you look here, this column show, this column tells you the different technologies that you could choose. This column tells you the cost of the electricity coming out of that technology. This column shows you the capital cost. And this one tells you how long it will take to build. So these are the factors that you take into account. So you have a look, you say, well, if I'm going to build solar, it's going to take me 18 months. If I'm going to build wind, 24 months. Gas, 24 months. Nuclear, 12 years. New coal, new coal, 10 years. So immediately you say, well, if I need a rapid response, I'm going to have a technological bias towards the quicker technologies to deploy. Because we have a shortage of electricity that's costing us politically and economically. Then you look at the cost. 4.1 US cents per kilowatt hour for wind PV, 5 for wind, 7 for gas, 19 for nuclear, 15 for coal. New coal. A lot of people go around and say, but South Africa, the cheapest electricity we can get in South Africa comes from the nuclear power station. So how can there be such a confusion? When I'm saying that the most expensive power is from the nuclear power station. What is the reason? The reason is this is that if you are taking new power from an existing nuclear power station, it is much cheaper than building a new one. So Kuburg was built in the 70s, and taking power out of Kuburg is not expensive. It is the cheap, as we're sitting here, some of the electrons lighting up my screen come from Kuburg, because it's a national grid. They've come, it's one system of electrons. Those electrons are very cheap, but that's not the question. The question is how do we build new capacity? And what is the cheapest to build new capacity? And that's a different question. And if you start building new capacity, then those are very expensive technologies, and they take a very long time. I have no doubt there's some benefits of those technologies. You know, you can have nuclear medicine, which we have in South Africa, that's used at our safari nuclear reactor in Pilandaba. Very good. You can have, you know, there's many things you can do with that technology. There's skills, there's training. But that is not my question. My question is, how do we overcome load shedding? Now, as quickly as possible. And then it's less academic when you say, what is the quickest, what is the cheapest? And what areas do we do with it? 
So this is an important slide for you to think about deeply because it's caused, it's become an extremely um, toxic discussion. And it doesn't need to be so toxic. You know, if you can just get down to what are we trying to achieve here? What are we trying to achieve? We're trying to overcome load shedding. That's our immediate priority. All right. So coming back here to this Mpumalanga question, as I said, there is the grid of the country, all of these cables, wires here, they join up the national grid. The, most of the power stations are in Pumalanga because that's where the coal fields were. So it was cheaper to build the power stations right there next to the coal fields. If you've been to Pumalanga, you can see there's a coal mine power station, coal mine power station. And then once it's in there, it goes into the national grid. The electricity goes and serves the whole country from Pumalanga. So if you want to not only build the, the cheapest and quickest to deploy technologies, you want to build it in the area where there is the grid. If you really want to overcome load shedding before 2024 election, you build it where there is the grid. Even then it's going to be difficult. Even then I don't think so. I don't know if we're going to make it. And the political consequences of that are serious. But you build it closest to the grid because you are then able to... Uh, you, if you have to build the grid um, from uh, in, into Northern Cape, the estimates are it's going to take 5 to 10 years to get the grid in there. So it's another delaying factor. You rather say, well, we'll take the second best option. Um, the sun in Mpumalanga is better than any other place in Europe. I don't know for what that's worth, except Spain. So the, quality, the sun is not the same everywhere. I'm sure you appreciate that. The sun in, 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 in uh, Northern Cape and, uh, and uh, in Namibia just comes at the right angle, the right intensity, and it produces electricity the most efficiently. efficiently. It was actually Albert Einstein when I was reading about this, who discovered that through the sun's rays, you can release electrons. It was him who discovered it in 19 or whatever, 1905. And it's taken a bit of longer time for us to use that in a technologically, economically viable way. It was, there were other electricity platforms. So the sun is very powerful in, in, in those areas. So we're not talking about solar panels on people's roofs. People think, oh no, it's just about heating my geezer. No, we're talking about massive industrial power stations in massive plant that is able to produce hundreds of and uh, hundreds and more than hundreds of uh, megawatts of electricity. So that grid it gives in Pumalanga a very serious advantage, a very serious advantage. So the just energy transition and the benefit of doing it in that province as well, at least as the ground zero, is that the workers and the skills and the communities who live off coal are there. So the transition then means that not only do you have the benefit of the grid, but how do you make this transition, energy transition, into a just? What does just, just mean? What does just mean? Just means just for the people. For the people. That's where the people come in. So the people are saying, well, not only is the grid there, but the people of coal are in the Malcheng. The people of coal are there. So, therefore, you want, to, you want to do the transition where the people are to try and give them alternative career paths. To give them alternative um, opportunities. If there is growth in your town and there's new things happening in your town, at least there's a chance that you or your children or somebody in your family will be moving into something new. But if you get told, that the new thing is good for South Africa, but it's happening in the Northern Cape. That doesn't, it makes it much more difficult for you. But if there's, new, if there's something good happening for South Africa and it's happening in Malachlen, it makes it somewhat easier because you can manage that better. So that's the, the, the just transition. Not only must it be happening at ground zero in Pumalanga for technical reasons, but also for social and just reasons. It needs to happen. There's a model that you can read about. I'm sure TK and his colleagues who organized me to come here and hopefully is uh, not regretting it too much will share these slides with you. Because this is a theoretical model that just shows you that this is, about, this is not about Pumalanga, it's not about just energy transition, it's about what happens when there's technological change. And when there's technological change, um, you are at point A in your model and you could land up at point B 
at point C or point D. Okay? And point A, you, the technology change comes. It's like you can't say, well, when the new South Africa comes, we are going to only allow people to use uh, telecom fixed lines and phone booths because that's better for us. We've already invested in that. <laughs> so new technology is coming, it's cheaper, it's coming, the new technology. So when there's a technological shift, if you say, I'm going to look backwards and not let anything change, you land at a point like B. At B, you have got less employment and you've got lower wages. If you do not, so the outcome of a technological change is not always good. I'm not a technological optimist. I'm not a technological pessimist. I am a technological agnostic. And it depends not on God in heaven, but on the people and their institutions as to how they respond to technological change. If you respond correctly, you will move not from A to B, but you'll move from A to D, which is more jobs and higher wages. But it's contingent. The technological change is contingent on your institutions. How are you responding? And what do I mean by this? At least, what is he talking about? It's contingent on the institutions. So, what are the kind of institutions here? Is South Africa's legal and public policy framework and the practices of our trade unions, our employer organizations, our government, all of those social partners, our decisions today will determine whether we have a just transition or we have a terrible transition. Because if we have a terrible transition, we will have a shortage of electricity, we'll have political turmoil, we'll have rising inequality, and only the rich will have electricity if we don't manage this problem. Because we've we're allowing the private sector now. We're allowing the private sector. So only the rich, only those who can afford will be like private school, private healthcare, private everything, private electricity. We, if we do not manage this problem, we have to manage it in a way that we say we're forward looking. We can see that this is coming. We are going to allow certain restructuring and transition to take place. But we have to be, the key word is forward looking, forward looking. I get so many people seem to be resisting change, resisting, it's like the boy who put his finger in the wall when the water was coming and saying, I, I'm stopped the sea. You it can't stop. This transition is coming. Now, how do we respond? We start to build around that inevitability. We build um, new factories, new industries, new technologies. It's got to be forward looking. And if you have that forward looking, if you say our unions, our employers, our government is forward looking, we are more likely to have a better outcome. But as I say, it's contingent. We can have a terrible outcome. If we mismanage this transition, we can have a terrible outcome. It's as likely, I think it's 50-50, maybe less than 50-50, that we're going to achieve a just transition. I think we're probably not going to achieve one. And maybe we should change the lecture slides to why we, didn't, why we are not going to achieve one. Because it looks to me that many things are falling, falling short because of some people who are not understanding what is at play in this transition. We need to be forward-looking. So some of the risks that um, need to be reduced, public resources are mobilized for this reskilling of workers. Are we going to do that? Um, are public utilities being repurposed um, so that we can use the capital um, that we have, the, the, the grids that we have, the factories, the power plants? Um, are policy frameworks being operated efficiently? Uh, so today we're talking about the IPP office. The IRP, government departments, are they efficient? Can they make this licensing procedure accelerate like they need to? Or are they going to continue to be slow? Are they going to continue to be inefficient? Is there going to be the allegation of corruption like with the car ships? Because if, that's, if that management falls apart of that transition, then you land up with the outcome that is not going to be very beneficial and only the rich will have power. So it is a very serious moment as to whether the outcome is contingent. What does contingent mean? The outcome depends. And who does it depend on? Depends on the social partners. Depends on the social partners. And I, I, I wish the social compact in South Africa could focus on the just energy transition outcome. Because if we get that right, our children will be better off. If we get that right, they'll be better off. If we don't, they won't. It'll just be more of the same, if not worse. So it requires a forward-looking, uh, forward-lookingness, and not a backward-lookingness. So then, I want to change tack a little bit. I heard there was an economist in the room, which is very exciting to know. And there's some readings that I'm going to refer to at the end of the paper here that you can. Uh, do, you dis do you distribute the the readings? 
I'm just drawing on some insights. So the first one was by myself. This is me. A paper called A New Economic Growth Model for South Africa, The Role of a Well-Managed, I should have said Contingent Energy Transition, published by Mapungubwe Institute for Strategic Reflection, MISTRA. So that's the first paper that TK has sent you. How, how did you send it? At the bottom of the USB. On your USB, okay. But you don't have to read that, because I've already told you about that. Then, um, <laughs> the, the next one is, uh, the, the, yeah, this one, this third one, uh, is a very recent paper. It's just come out last week. And I drew on some of the more recent, like, what must we do urgently to deal with the load shedding in South Africa? So, um, 20, uh, insights from 2021, South Africa's worst load shedding year so far, June 2022. You can read that one. That's just immediate. Now, what, what must government do now? To, so that by the time the next election comes, at least there's more power in the system. What do we do now? Uh, and then the middle one is more academic for the economists and the aspirant among you, which is by a guy called Jean Pesani Ferry. Not Ferry, but Ferry. I don't know how you say that. I don't speak French. Now, it's a policy brief on climate policy is macroeconomic policy published by Peterson Institute for International Economics. Now, I'm a macroeconomist by training, uh, but I've had to learn about energy really quickly. When there's a shortage of something, it's, it's good to learn about it. Now, this paper says that climate policy is macroeconomic policy. So that's wonderful for somebody like me, because it's saying you're just learning the same thing. All right, so that's the last paper I want to talk about. Do I have more, a few more minutes? Okay. So, what does he say in this, this Mr. Furi, Furi, Pisani, Furi? So, you can read it, and it's not long. Um, read it, uh, it's about seven or eight pages, very nice, a little summary of the issues. Why is uh, climate policy macro policy? So, he makes a few good, good points. He says, decades of procrastination have turned the expected smooth transition into what it into what is likely to be an abrupt one. So we all know this. If you don't do something, you're going to have to rush at the end. So like, let's say you have to get your hair ready for something. I wish I had more hair. Then, if you don't do it, you have to quickly do it. Okay? It's the same with the energy transition. If you procrastinate, when you have to do it, you're going to be in a rush. And he's saying the world is in a rush because we have delayed. Um, the European Systemic Risk Board pointed out in 2016 that due to delays in dealing with the problem, the transition to net zero will be too late and too sudden. So it's going to be too late and too sudden. It's full of paradoxes, this man. It's too late and too sudden. And he says the key instruments that will be used will be the pricing of carbon. So I said economists are concerned about relative prices. So if the price of wind and solar is cheaper, and the price of coal is higher to build a new power station, it's going to, the price signal is going to tell you something. Okay? And he's saying, well, this pricing is very important, and we need to start to price carbon. So if you know some economics, you'll know that there's things like externalities and external costs. And if a price signals don't work properly, price signals don't work properly if you don't internalize the costs. And for the whole century, when you before, when your grandparents were meeting each other, and your grandparents' parents were meeting each other in the early 1900s and 1890s, wherever they might have been, for the whole century since then, we haven't priced carbon correctly. We've been thinking it's really cheap to put petrol in our cars and to burn coal, but the price of carbon has been reflected in the changing atmosphere. We never caught that price. And now that is catching up with us. So the price of carbon is going to be changing. So, so he, what he's arguing is that it will be done either through taxation, and you know there's carbon taxes coming. Carbon taxes coming to try and internalize the price of carbon. Because if the, if the price of carbon should be much higher than what it is, it's been artificially cheap. It hasn't included the price of the damage that it's doing to the environment. And the second will be implicit through policy, through regulation. That, that, that we're going to start to price correctly, so price signals will start to be more will be, start to be more reliable. Another economic concept. I'm just going to bounce through them quickly, which are so interesting. 
and you might have heard about this, is stranded assets. So in, in, in some cases, this pricing shock, this negative shock, because we start to price carbon correctly, will lead to stranded assets and an accelerated obsolescence of existing capital stock. So what this is, is if you're planning something big like your energy grids and your energy decisions through the IRP, if you're planning something big for a long period, with a 10 to 30, 40 year payback, and you invest in something where you do not take into account the true price of carbon, that asset will be stranded. So you will build something that will be stranded. And you'll build something that will not be usable and will never get an economic return. That's a very big risk for planners like yourselves if you're planning. That you build, you invest in something that will not give you a return and it will be stranded. I have responded in arguments with people who have shown me this paper to say, but South Africa is a bit different because we are in a sweet spot in the sense that our assets, most of our assets, we have got some new coal power stations, you call them Medupi, Kusile, they're new and they're going to be with us for many years. But most of our 18 to 20 coal fired power stations are, are very old and are beyond their economic life. So we don't have the risk of stranded assets. Really, it's not a major threat in South Africa. It's not a major threat that we are going to have stranded assets in the sense that all this capital stock that would have been useful for the next 30 years is now going to be uh, decommissioned. We need, these power stations are decommissioning themselves. That is one of the things what load shedding is. It's like having a very old car that doesn't want to go, it keeps breaking down. Our power stations were built by I don't remember which, but some old politicians from the previous era, they were not built under our era, and these things are older, they, they are actually, the, you hear they're breaking down, they're breaking down, we need to maintain them, we need to maintain them, but the fundamental is they are too old. So we were not going to have this big risk of stranded assets when the carbon pricing comes correct. The one area where I'm quite worried about stranded assets, and this is a bit of an aside, is on petrol and diesel. Now, South African refineries, this is, I don't want to go too long into this, because this is not really the, the electricity sector. South Africa's got these really big oil refineries. So we bring oil from Iran, we bring oil from all these different countries into our refineries, and we make petrol and diesel and kerosene. And those refineries are closing down. They're closing down. And there's a big political debate. Should we let them close down? Why are they closing down? And they say, well, we as market forces are telling us, there's, well, there's new regulations. There's new regulations. There's new regulations for how much uh, the diesel, how many particles uh, can be in the diesel. And you get 95, 94, 93, the different diesel levels. And the Europe is driving these new regulations for diesel. The engines that are being built require a better quality, a better quality. So these, these refineries are saying, no, no, we, we can't, it's not economic for us to invest in this new technology. We'd rather just import a refined product. It's a major thing. Then some of our people say, no, 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 let's, let's rather the state buy the refinery. We will take it over. We need to have a refinery. And they'll give you good reasons why we need to pay for a refinery. Because we need the kerosene, we need the bitumen, we need all of the byproducts, we need to beneficiate, we need industrialization. But there is a risk of stranded assets. Because if you build, if you input taxpayers' money into a 30-year refinery project right now, there's a, there is a likelihood, there is a risk that that asset will not pay for itself. It will be stranded. Maybe electric vehicles will come. Maybe the standard of the vehicles that we have won't take that diesel. We'll say to the farmers, you take it for your tractors. But the market will be. So we must listen to that pricing. There's a risk of a stranded asset there, and it's very much in play. As we speak, it's in play. It could be such as you hear, well, my minister said, no, we should actually put money into this now. We must buy that refinery. I would say we must be careful. So the energy transition is mainly about electricity, but it's also about liquid fuels <coughs> as well, and gas. Um, then the paper talks about consumption versus investment. It says a carbon price will trigger new research spending, new infrastructure spending, accelerated renewal of equipment. Uh, the rate of economic growth may not decline, says uh, Mr. Pisani uh, Perry, but the composition of that growth will be affected. There'll be higher investment and lower consumption. 
And they, this is how they frame their just transition in these rich countries. They talk about the fact that the consumer may be negatively affected by this energy transition. The composition will be more into investment, less into consumption. And they, they say, well, if there's going to be a carbon tax, that money must be used in just transition, in the social fund. So the carbon tax money mustn't be used elsewhere, but must be used in the just transition, because the consumer is the one who's going to suffer. What about the impact on public finances? What does this paper say about that? In many cases, the impact of the energy transition will be negative um, assistance, uh, sorry, uh, will be negative, and assistance will be required uh, where government will have to allocate fiscal resources to support vulnerable households, as I've said, due to the regressive impact of the carbon tax. South Africa, we need to again apply this idea. So what they're saying, that's going to be bad for the fiscus, because the fiscus is going to have to assist in, the, in funding the just transition in these rich countries. But in South Africa, it might again be a, a different case. If we're saying that our energy transition is happening on the, in the context of a shortage of electricity, <laughs> then if the energy transition can bring on stream new electricity and reduce load shedding, the fiscal effects of that will be positive, not negative. Because the, the shortage of electricity is leading to low growth, low employment, all of those. So therefore, the, uh, and the fiscus obviously suffers. If you, if you do not have um, growth, then your tax uh, revenues are affected by that. So I've said the stranded asset case doesn't really apply to South Africa as it's been argued in this paper. And I think the fiscal argument doesn't really apply directly because it's not only a negative fiscal effect of the transition, if it restores energy security, then the fiscal effect is improved. So, the decarbonization will have distributional consequences, impacting on the consumption of poorer households, um, and therefore the revenue from carbon taxes or carbon permits should be redistributed to those negatively affected. And it should not be viewed as a new source of tax for other purposes. In addition to the paying for the cost of mitigation by promoting the energy transition, taxes should be used to contribute to the cost of adaptation to climate change. So there's two different elements where this resources will be required. One is in mitigation, or changing our energy patterns. But adaptation is a new problem because climate change is already happening. Climate change is already happening. Areas that are dry are becoming more dry. Areas that are wet are becoming more wet. We've seen floods and such. So part of the money that is required for, uh, um, for dealing with the effects of climate change must be about adaptation. Are the water flows correct? Are the irrigation schemes correct? And those are all linked to, if there's going to be that carbon tax uh, that, that these, these authors talk about, should be applied to those, to those as well. And then lastly, lastly, is about technological change again. Um, once you have the technological change and you are using uh, low carbon sources of electricity, that um, can be used to create new industries and new exports. So there is a lot of talk, for example, about the hydrogen economy. How does the hydrogen economy relate to this? Just as an example, there's also electric vehicles, it's another. Another new, a new area that can open up. So through re having renewable energy inputs, whether it's wind or solar or low carbon inputs, you are able to split water, and it can be dirty water, it can be seawater. You can split water into its two components, which is H2O. So you split it into hydrogen and oxygen in an electrolyzer, using the, the energy from the sun. That hydrogen is a fuel which can be put into trucks. I don't know if you remember the president went to Malukwena, I think it's the, the platinum mine, and drove a hydrogen truck not too long ago. A hydrogen powered truck. It's a fuel. So you are then able to create a fuel source. It's a gas, hydrogen gas. And some people, it's a very volatile gas. It's a very dangerous gas on its own, but you can manage it. And some people have made liquid forms of hydrogen gas, so it can literally be a fuel that you put into your hydrogen. Uh, now, a country like Namibia is ahead of us. I always talk about how Pumalanga is got potential, but Namibia 
has seen the opportunity to export hydrogen gas up the coast of Africa into Rotterdam and then the Europeans can start to use hydrogen gas and don't have to buy the energy from Vladimir Putin. And they are working on this. They've got the sunlight, they've got the power, they've got the ability to do it. And that's an example of what South Africa's thinking needs to be. How do we begin to open new sectors? Like, there's never existed in our lifetime that you could have a real hydrogen gas sector exporting massive potential just from taking, it's basically taking solar energy and making it into hydrogen gas through that process of, uh, of the electrolysis, electrolyte. So that's a new sector. There's, uh, and there's other new sectors as well that can be opened up. Also, the, um, there's, there's the carrot and the stick. So I'm speaking about the carrot. But there's also the stick where some of these countries are saying they're not going to allow free trade as if you are a heavy carbon economy. They're going to start putting duties on you. So South Africa is a heavy carbon economy. So what they'll say is, whoa, your Cecil, Cecil, Cecil is going to start making hydrogen. Thank goodness. Because that, those Cecil plants make more. If you had to fly over the world on a spaceship and look down at the carbon production patterns, those Cecil plants are producing carbon like you cannot believe. It's like pumping it into the air. So that is intense. Never, never mind our coal power stations as well. But you've got this, you've got coal being converted into pet, into liquid fuel. So if these countries start to over time say, well, we're not going to be wanting to import your fruits, your vegetables, your cars, your steel, your products, because they, 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 they're dirty. Yeah? There's too much carbon in that stuff. You're killing the planet. We're trying to incentivize you. That is the stick that we haven't gone into. That's a risk that we have. That if we think that we can stand alone and resist this energy transition, I think there's a lot of risk with regard to our export competitiveness going forward. So the, the opportunities are there for new uh, new ventures and they are happening. As I said, Namibia seems to be well ahead of us, but Sassel itself, Sassel itself is talking about there's a fisher trops method that was used during the apartheid era to turn coal into liquid fuel. It's a method. It was coming from the German, from German chemists. And South Africa was the only country that did that for its own apartheid reasons because they were obviously scared that during apartheid they might not be allowed to import fuel, oil, and that would be the end of apartheid. So they developed their own strategic industries of turning coal into liquid fuel. That technology can be reconverted to make hydrogen. And it is being done, it is being worked on. Um, so they, 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 you have to open up those new industries, new ways of doing things to be competitive. So I think that was more or less most of what I wanted to talk about today. Um, just to talk about the importance of this transition and to try and deepen our understanding of the real driving fundamentals. Thank you very much. I'm saying that there might be hope if we can manage this transition carefully. But there's nothing, I'm not closing the coal power stations. These things are going to close. You know, it's, it's, they are too old. <laughs> I'm not closing them. I mean, these things, it's not my presentation that's closing them. <laughs> I'm telling you now <laughs> that these things are going, this is the process. If you, even, the, even the government's plans say these things are being decommissioned. That's the government planning. It's not my idea. I'm saying if these things are closing, not me. I wish they weren't closing. I wish they could last forever. If they're closing, what are we going to do? And then I'm saying, well, how, it's a contingent thing. What are we going to do? How do we bring the communities together to say, we need jobs? So that part, I'm with you, local. That's the local. The thing I'm talking about is very technical, about just a sequencing thing. There's a fight going on at the moment between some of the, 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 the people who make the energy investments and the DTIC. That's a, it's a small fight that will be overcome. The minister said he's going to be pragmatic. So he was just saying, they were saying we cannot be forced to buy local content when there's no local content. We're happy to buy local content when there is local content. You know, so it's a question of how do you make that happen. But to be honest with you, it's, we're on the same page. It's, it's through doing what you said. It's through doing what you said that we can try and make a success of this um, transition. Rather than this transition being something that is going to actually just, it's really going to be a major shock 
on the new South Africa. A major shock on New South Africa if this transition is not managed. It's going to have, we will have a change. I don't want to say it, but things will change. Because this thing is going to cause a lot of problems if it's not managed properly. And if we can't agree on the way forward and we're going to say we can do it backward, then I think we really are not doing ourselves any good favors. That's just my view of it. But we're on the same page. Also, where does the gas come from? You know, we have got gas prospects at Brilpada and places like that off the east coast. But they are only prospects. So we'll have to probably buy gas from Mozambique and other parts of Africa and parts of the world. So it's not like we have gas. You know, there's an idea that we have gas. We don't have it. But we are we prepared to import it. We import the diesel, so we can import the gas if it makes economic sense. I don't have a problem. But it is a fact that almost people talk like there is gas. They do talk like there is gas, but there isn't. There might be gas. And that's also going to take long. We haven't even started drilling yet at Brilpada. We can't wait for everything to see if there's gas. We can, we, we can import it and hope we find gas. Okay? It might even be oil or something. I don't know. We'll see when we drill. We have to drill. Um, clean coal, I'm not an expert on that. You know, I read an amazing story about somebody said, in future generations, they're going to say, can you believe these people burned coal? Coal is such a valuable substance. Why did they burn it? So I don't know what science is going to tell us. Somebody's saying about science. Coal can be used, for example, to revitalize land, agricultural land. It's got properties that are not just for burning. And maybe the market will be sitting here in 15 years and the coal price will be booming for another purpose, not for burning. I don't know. Technology will tell us. We're going to use this coal. It's a wonderful substance given to us by God, as people say. But do we burn it? I don't know. Burning it does work. It makes it hot. We can have a dry. We can make a coal-fired power station. It can burn, but maybe it can do other things as well. Time will tell. Technology will tell. The clean coal itself, there is, again, it's like the PBMR. There is investment. There is investigation. But it's not a proven technology for the table. When they give us those big loans, like the World Bank and stuff, like you say, that wasn't clean coal per se. I might be wrong. It was about ensuring that the, the gas coming out of Midupi and Kusile was cleaned. That was the one that I remember. Is that the one you're talking yes, about? That's the concept. Yeah. So the gas, the, so there'll be less sulfur. De de yes. And desulfurizing. Now it's an economic question. I know the ESCOM leadership, but they don't want to put money into this. They want to just let the dirty coal go into the sky. Because we'd rather use that money to stop load shedding. You know, we'd rather use that money to build electricity than to clean the coal. But they're being forced by the World Bank. It's crazy. The World Bank says, you promised us you'd clean the coal. You are the dirtiest. We, the World Bank saying, you are the dirtiest country. We, this is the last coal investment we gave in the world, and you promised you'd clean it. And we say to the World Bank, let us just, no, oh, we can use those billions for something else. But they won't let us off the hook. So it's, that's the kind of debate around the clean coal that I'm aware of. Um, Coming to the, the Valcom beneficiation point, uh, the, um, you know, it's really uh, uh, interesting to talk about um, the, the gold mining, the gold fields of, of Valcom. They opened up, as you said, I think in the 80s, you know, the, the Oppenheimers and Anglo coal, this big thing. Then this question is beneficiation. How do you beneficiate coal, gold? What do you do? can make jewelry, I suppose, Di uh, rings, earrings. What can you make with gold? So there was that question of, is South Africa a mining country, or are we a beneficiating country? Like in Botswana, they managed to get the Oppenheimers, the beers, to do diamond cutting in Botswana. And it was a big achievement from the Botswana government. And we said, no, we, we should be doing much better with the way we're getting our beneficiation. And we haven't always done it in the direct way that they, for example, would want to do. But there's indirect benefits from having gold mining activity in Belgium that are not just about the line of beneficiation. Gold, make something out of gold. Because you've got both the upstream and the downstream benefits. So I know there's companies that are, were located in Belgium, Vesconite, people with different products that were put in place making jobs for the mining industry. So even if you can't produce gold earrings and you're battling with that because they make them in Italy or whatever it might be, there's still such huge benefit 
from the, knowing the, the streams in and out of, it's not just one. I'm, I'm saying we often used to focus on one thing. And then there was also talk of lateral. So for example, now Vesconite uses that technology in the, in the, in the farms. And they export certain things from, that they were part of the mining. So you kind of move your technology out of that, that linear idea into something else. And it's useful in something else. So, yeah, so I, I think what Welcome should do now is to have, it should invest in renewable energy in that area. You know, that, that will help to create the jobs that I'm talking about from Pumalani. It will help to create the investment, the construction jobs, the, the maintenance jobs, the um, maybe downstream uh, uh, um, uh, metal work that will go into all of that. That you know, that's that's where the future is. The mine must be the the mine must be the, the, the must be the client. The mine must agree to buy that electricity. You know, those are the kind of things. That's where they, you know, to push for beneficiation is just too linear. That's what I'm trying to say. We, we all fell into that trap. It's sometimes too linear. You can, you can get other linkages from, from activity that exists uh, in, in a particular area. But I really, I mean, yeah, that's just my thoughts, uh, to, to be honest. I think, yeah, the, the, I was going to be very worried about your, your yo-yo description because I felt like I was just contributing to a yo-yo <laughs> But my, my wise colleague saved me. He said we all are not actually a yo-yo. We're kind of moving, we're just emphasizing different points along the same road. Thank you very much. Thank you.